Ah, Mega Man X6. I reviewed you nearly five years ago, that's scary to think about. And every time I've revisited you since, I realize nothing's changed. Supposedly, you were meant to be a very hard game, and all the degenerates that criticize you just aren't skilled enough to comprehend your true genius. Well, I'd say I'm a fairly competent Mega Man X player, enjoying and completing challenge runs where I finish the various installments with heavy restrictions, and all the same, I can only come to one conclusion. X6, you still suck balls. I suppose you're good for one thing, though. You're exploitable for clicks on YouTube, and I could use some of those right about now, so I'll take this opportunity to defeat you once and for all in spectacular fashion. That's right, we're tackling the game on its highest difficulty, Extreme, with the ultimate goal to use absolute absolutely no upgrades whatsoever. I define no upgrades as no weapons or techniques acquired from bosses, no health upgrades from hard tanks or injured reploids, no sub tanks, no parts, and no armor. Not even the Falcon armor for X. We're only allowed what is available to both characters by default, which includes the Z-Saber for X and the Z-Buster for Zero. Is it possible to beat Mega Man X6 under these conditions? All footage throughout the video is recorded from a genuine PS1, by the way, with an official Rockman X6 copy, much cheaper, and the international version might as well be in Japanese anyway. So safe states are out of the question, and you'll have to take my word that I don't own any cheat devices or discs. To start with, then, the intro stage. There's not much to comment on with this one because it's very tame and short. X is forced into his falcon armor here, but as long as you don't use its air dash and keep your health bar above 50%, since the falcon armor reduces damage by half, I'd say we're playing within the rules. I beat D1000 with my health well above the threshold, and so that's level 0 we can cross off the list. Making progress, baby. Right after, I want to go and unlock Zero, so we have him as soon as we can. Out of all the alternate pathways in the eight main stages, personally, I find Laser Institutes the most simple to reach and clear, so that's where we're headed next. Off the bat, I had a slight bit of trouble because this injured Reploid above the spikes has a life up part that extends your health bar, and jumping over him is a little tricky. I failed it the first time, but after reloading my save, I did just fine. Up ahead is a lot of redirecting lasers to open doors, which is no issue even on extreme to be honest, with pretty manageable enemies. It's all buttery smooth sailing until we reach Zero Nightmare. When I initially tried to battle him up close with the Z Saber, I kept getting spanked, but once I started mixing that with charge buster shots from a distance to get in more safe damage, as well as when I learned to stay to the far left or right of the room when he summons those meteors from the ground, it was a pretty easy win. <laughs> Now to make a secondary save file where we'll be doing the zero side of things. In terms of the eight main stages, I don't have a preference for order really, so why not go left to right, top to bottom? This leads us to the Amazon area, where the first injured Reploid has a life up, but he's simple to ignore. Beyond that, there isn't anything noteworthy about this level. You can easily jump over or damage boost through most enemies since there are plenty of checkpoints, and I encounter no hiccups to speak of. To this day, I stand by it. Commander Yamark is smoking hot with her flirty eyes, but her encounter itself isn't so hot. Blindly shoot or hack away and you're Gucci, really. Piss easy is what that is, and so Amazon area is finished as both X and Zero. Inami Temple, though, presents a significant increase in difficulty. For starters, the fact I visited Laser Institute earlier means I have to deal with those X and Zero soul bodies that periodically show up to harass you, and the gimmick of acid rain pouring down means you have to be quite fast and take little damage from enemies. The Mombando Bastards are a pain in this regard, because you have to wait for them to let down their guard, and if you attack too soon, they will keep it up even longer. Fortunately, in this cave section, you can go back once you're at the end of it and restore your health on this pad, giving you more leeway to clear what comes after after the cave and reach the next checkpoint. Now we're in for some shit, however. After the platforming segment above the water with the rockets, you have to deal with pits, enemies arising from out of set pits with little warning, bullets being shot by set enemies, the inconvenient soul bodies I've talked about, and even some dreaded nightmare viruses. Mind you, there's the acid rain during all of this, and when you take damage in this game, you get staggered for a bit, making the whole situation ripe for classic knockback into pits. The final kick in the teeth is that you have to blow up this thing to gain access to the next checkpoint, and since it's walled off by enemies, it's not really viable to damage boost through. 
There's no secret sauce to surviving this whole stretch. You simply gotta pay the bills with the skills. The last chunk is less problematic, thankfully, because there's always this healing pad at the top you can resort to to regain health. Once I had reminded myself of where the tiny cores are, it was a swift endeavor to wipe them all out and gain access to the boss. As for Rainy Turd Lloyd himself, he is a joke as Zero specifically. Just destroy the shards on his back and then blast away with the Z-Buster. You should have enough health to brute force this one. By contrast, we'll actually have to fight Rainy Turd Lloyd as X, since there is no way to deal that much damage that fast. So, when he rolls back and forth across the room, you do not have enough time to properly wall jump over him continuously, and he also spams bubbles that fly off in random directions, making it even more unfeasible to avoid damage consistently. The trick is to slash the shards on his back until they are one hit removed from breaking, sit out his following attack phase, and then instantly break the shards in his rest phase after that to dish out the maximum damage. I repeated the cycle three times and that did the job for me. Not too bad, I died a handful of times in the middle of the stage as both X and Zero, but Inami Temple is behind us. Next up is Laser Institute again, which is a repeat from before, only now you head to the right here at this reflection section, rather than down. A very brief and easy level. Shield Sheldon is waiting on the other side, and I've never had much trouble with this guy. Do a wall jump over these two shells, get in a few hits, move to the opposite end out of harm's way, dodge his predictable attack, rinse repeat. Later, when he summons the laser shields around him, maneuver around him as best as you can, and sneak charge shots as X or saber slashes as zero, between the openings until he is dead. And with that, we've got stage 3 of the main A Dunzo. Nice. We're keeping up the momentum with North Pole Area, which is another brisky level. On the slope climb at the start, don't even waste time and effort going into the little hiding spots to avoid the avalanche. Repeatedly dash jumping up is a perfectly safe method and far more efficient to boot. The rest of the stage is played as normal with few enemies or dangerous hazards to mention. As X, I got trapped and died twice where the ice cubes fall down in a random pattern, but that was out of my control and I made it out alive on the third attempt. Getting trapped like that is no concern for Zero thanks to his double jump. Of course, Blizzard Wolfang himself is also pathetic, standing still half the time, and his attacks are slow and laughably predictable. A boss as free as Mission Street, and a pretty free stage overall for our adventure. Sadly, that was the calm before the storm, because the delivery guy is knocking at my door with my donuts order. That said, before I answer, I make sure to visit Recycle Lab first and run out of lives there to immediately leave again, since the little nightmare buggers from Amazon area would show up in Magma area otherwise, and I do not want those interfering during my donut fights in any capacity. Yeah, that's how the confusing and unexplained nightmare system works, don't you know? Going into Recycle Lab replaces the nightmare buggers with these moving silver brick things, which hinder you slightly but only show up in this vertical platforming section. It's perfectly manageable and much preferable. Now, this portion is actually somewhat challenging, with nightmare viruses roaming around and flames coming out of the floors and ceilings that can kill you in like two touches. The visibility is kinda lousy, since the screen doesn't always scroll fast enough and can get you blindsided, but overall the section is at least not overwhelming. Patience is key, and combined with some precision, you'll manage to get through. So, the actual donuts themselves. The first and second encounters are fine and pretty forgiving, since the layouts of the rooms are unobtrusive and allow you to attack all four of the cores relatively stress-free. Donut number three is where the situation gets more dicey. You see, the battle takes place on this slope, which makes hitting the bottom left core in particular quite awkward. The safest approach is to wait on the far left of the room, get in a few hits as the donut approaches, and then jump over, and then on the far right of the room you have a tight window where you can land some hits after jumping over as well. And the problem is that there are also nightmare viruses around here, and they respawn once you've off-screened and then on-screen their spawn points again. I suppose there's no better opportunity than now to mention that nightmare viruses are certified cunts and the worst enemies in the game by a landslide because they have a tendency to shoot projectiles, love swarming toward you, and on extreme they can even teleport around and often on top of you if you aren't moving far out of their vicinity. 
They can also phase and shoot through walls, which is totally fair because the player cannot do either. Combine the above and you have a demanding little endurance test on your hands here, but mostly as X. The reason being that X is sluggish with the Z Saber and can only perform one slash in a single combo, whereas Zero is a much more proficient swordsman and can whip out three super fast slashes in one combo. Additionally, there is also the classic Saber Dash cancelling exploit, where by rapidly mashing the attack and dash buttons in succession, you can chain slashes together without the recovery frame from a finished combo slowing you down. As such, Zero can eat through basically anything that doesn't have invincibility frames after getting hit, and the cores on the donuts are one of those things. This difference is felt immensely with the infamous fourth donut fight. Let's cover half the screen in instant kill lava, while forcing the player to hop between a ridiculously scattered and obstructed assortment of platforms, while also shoving in nightmare viruses at various intervals in a climbing segment as the cherry on top. The issue is simple. Not only do you need to get right up to the cores to hit them, putting you at risk at nearly all times to receive a projectile in your face, the bottom two cores are usually ass up in lava, leaving you with very sparse opportunities to even touch them. Essentially, you have to get lucky that the donut rises in high enough for the bottom cores to become damageable a few times over, and then you make these near-pixel-perfect dash jumps to return to safety. As X then, this encounter is dreadful. Somehow, I was able to eke out a victory in only about half an hour, but the truth is that a lot of that victory hinged on the donut positioning itself favorably. It could have taken way longer. Playing as Zero, however, a truckload of damage can be inflicted so quickly that I ate up this donut on my very first try. It is a world of difference. Still, that's not to say this isn't an abominable mini-boss, and even after you destroy it, you have to be incredibly careful not to get killed by any of the nightmare viruses that are still present further up the climb, or you'll have to restart the whole ordeal from scratch. Thankfully, I did make it to the fifth donut even on my X playthrough, and this is probably the easiest of the group. Seriously, what is with this whiplash? A difficulty curve, you say? We ain't never heard of that. Compared to the hell leading up to Blaze Heatnix, he is also an insane pushover, and not even worth discussing. In total, Magma Area took me close to an hour to finish as X and only 15 minutes as zero, but I'm relieved the donuts are no more and that we can move on. To another rubbish stage, of course, Weapon Center. I guess the good news is that the actual level part is not that hard. Sure, it loves raining down showers of diarrhea, but it's practically a straight line and embarrassingly short. I had some deaths here, but once they came to grips with the groove of the mini-bosses again and plainly decided to keep moving forward, only stopping or holding back a smidge to dodge specific hazards or enemies, this was surprisingly a walk in the park as both characters. Well, relatively speaking, <laughs> Infinity Virginian, on the other hand, is not a walk in the park. His gimmick is that he creates multiple fake copies of himself, and whenever he does, his clones will release liquid balls that home in on you. This is already tricky on normal, but on extreme, the number of these is through the roof, and so the problem is the overwhelming amount of vomit that can occupy the screen. It's worth noting, however, that the fight ideally plays out differently between X and Zero. The bubbles in the clones are quite sturdy and take way way too much punishment from X, so as him, it's not even worth attempting to control the madness. Instead, it's all about mastery of movement, quick reflexes, and optimizing every inch of space available to you in order to dodge everything that's going on and find those small opportunities to hit the real Infinity Maginion. That said, there is undoubtedly an element of randomness involved. Getting cornered or whatever is often inevitable, and your chances of success are highly influenced by how stuff happens to line up. This is the hardest maverick of the main eight by a long shot, and took me close to 50 minutes to beat as X. For the Zero playthrough, I learned from my mistake and actually did Weapon Center as the third stage in the chain, considering the bosses will level up with more health the later you encounter them. I recommend taking advantage of that, but like I said, as Zero, the battle is a bit of a different beast and you should shift your focus altogether to staying on the ground as much as you can. The Z-Buster deals a ton of damage and is actually capable of destroying the liquid balls and the clones pretty efficiently. This allows Zero to prevent too much crap from spawning in with proper execution and a pinch of luck. It is still the hardest Maverick out of the main eight, absolutely, but the fundamental difference in approach as well as Infinity Maginion being level one now lowered my time investment to merely 15 minutes. Not gonna lie, that was a bit of a struggle. It's doable with some perseverance and good play, but damn, this boss sucks. 
Well, hey, after that, you can breathe easier with the next stage, at least, Recycle Lab. Granted, rumor has it this place is so frustrating it drove a man to toss and break his controller, and it is certainly a punishing level, but since the main threat is an instant kill, finishing this one is pretty standard fare. The only notable aspect specific to our challenge is to skip over this injured Reploid since he holds a life up. I accidentally touched him a zero, so that was a wonderful stage reset, and at the very tail end of the level, you gotta make sure not to drop down here. If that does happen, it's best to let yourself get crushed, as to not grab the heart tank. The jump across is moderately tight and nerve-wracking as X, but mercifully, I nailed it on my first try, and as zero, you can simply do an air dash from one side to the other. Much more forgiving. Afterwards, FisherPriceToy.jpg can be put back in the trash pile, and the true boss, Metal Shark Player, sits among legends such as Commander Yamark and Blizzard Wolfang in terms of epic encounters, so you know what that means. Another level conquered by the Master Gamer RZ, and we've arrived at the last stage of the main eight. Central Museum is a bitch. It's a toss-up between this and Magma Area for the worst level so far, but I think I'ma have to go with Central Museum. Why? Well, for starters, this place is chock full of, filled to the brim, littered, and absolutely infested with nightmare viruses on extreme. It is totally excessive and makes almost every room a nightmare to navigate. A lot of the time, the layouts are so cramped as well, with tight corridors and ladders and what have you, and that mixes horrendously with nightmare viruses moving and shooting through walls. Genuinely, to make it through many of these sub-areas, it's a lot of trial and error, experimenting with which nightmare viruses to actually kill, and which ones to potentially run past and hope they don't hunt you down. There's not much of a shortcut or cheese method to any of it either, you simply gotta do it, and at the end of each sub-area, you also need to blow up this part of a totem pole to be transported back to the museum's main hall. These things are always tucked behind a group of nightmare viruses, making it all too likely you'll run out of whatever little health you'll have remaining, and on top of that, you need to successfully destroy the full totem pole in the museum's main hall to activate a new checkpoint. Die, and you'll need to redo the entire sub-area you just came out of. The first three of these shouldn't give you grief, but the fourth totem pole sits in front of a bed of spikes, making it tricky to hit the bottom faces and easy to get owned. To further rub salt into the wound, the four sub-areas these totem gates send you to are randomly chosen between a pool of eight, and they vary in difficulty. A few of them are a breeze in relative terms, while others are absurd, and one in particular was impossible for me. If you're unlucky enough to get this vertical climb sub-area at any point, you might as well restart the stage from the beginning because the number of nightmare viruses here is staggering and the layout is so not conducive to picking them off. No matter how much I attempted, no matter what I tried, I could not get past it. And yeah, once the sub-area you get has been decided, it will not change after dying. It is the worst fucking thing in the world to make it to the fourth totem gate, only to be greeted by this sub-area. So much progress lost at the whim of the game. There's also one specific sub-area that X cannot overcome without upgrades, which I luckily didn't get as him and only as zero, but still, what the hell? Moreover, if you accidentally were to hop into the alternate pathway, entrance here that you cannot leave. If you rescue this injured Reploid, which I accidentally did as X and didn't realize until I finished the entire goddamn level, or if you happen to collect this heart tank, which happened on my Zero playthrough, that is an instant stage reset. Make no mistake, this is a gauntlet, a marathon, where you best do your prayers for decent RNG, and even with decent RNG, this has to be the most agonizing level to beat if we don't count bosses. No hyperbole, I hate it, Central Museum, though akin to Magma Area, the Maverick fight is a hundred times less painful. Really, Ground Scarevich is an anti squash. I mean, I'll gladly take it, but how can the difficulty drop so dramatically within seconds? Best not to question it, I suppose, and briefly relish in the fact we've got all eight main stages cleared, with neither X nor Zero requiring any upgrades. I say briefly because I am not looking forward to the fortress stages and their bosses, but we're in balls deep now, and I refuse to back out. After all, this is where things get juicy and shit hits the fan. 
As we head into Secret Lab 1 with X, we immediately run into a roadblock that cannot be circumvented without breaking the rules. A section with spikes that are too tall to clear without using any weapons. By extension, it is with a heavy heart I have to report that it is impossible to beat Mega Man X6 on Extreme, or any difficulty for that matter, with no upgrades as X. It would be lame to abandon him though, don't you think? So let's move the goalpost and discover what is the least amount of upgrades necessary. Shooting out an ice burst and using that as a platform gives you the height to hop over the first set of spikes, but then the following sets are too tall even for that. That's not good, but after 10 seconds of research on YouTube, shoutouts to the MVP screaming Yoshi, it turns out there is a strategy to get to the top. What you have to do is shoot out the ice burst as normal, then jump off as it's about to disappear, land another ice burst on top of the spikes while you're in the air, and also cling on to set ice burst by spamming the wall jump. From there, when the ice burst disappears, open the pause menu, pull out the ground dash and activate it as you're holding left, open the pause menu again, pull out the magma blade and fire it while holding left, and keep repeating these two steps back and forth until you're past the spikes. Believe me, this is deceptively finicky, requiring spot-on timing and mashing to maintain the necessary height. It took me at least a dozen attempts before I managed to succeed once, and you need to pull it off twice in a row. It was then that I also realized you physically do not have enough Ice Burst ammunition, and enemies do not drop health or ammo refills on extreme. Opting for the least evil option in terms of this challenge here, I gathered four energy ups which is straightforward and gives you the exact ammo cap needed. Diving back into the strats, I got better and better at it with practice, and soon enough, I did manage to scale the set piece without the jumper part. Dang, that was a mouthful, so I'm glad this section is a piece of cake at zero. His double jump grants him enough height for all the spikes, thus he is still operating fully within the rules. All that effort as X was for naught, however, as Nightmare Mother at the end of the stage is, without a single doubt in my mind, the worst boss in the entire X series. Between each attack phase, the two blobs of tumors, I don't know what else to call them, rotate around the room at top speed and which direction they go in is a 50-50 every time. Now, with our current configuration as X, if the blobs move counterclockwise, it is barely possible to jump over with insane reflexes and precise positioning. I cannot even put into words how strict this is. But if they decide to move clockwise, you are absolutely guaranteed to take damage. The fight may theoretically be doable with pitch-perfect RNG and pitch-perfect performance, but considering the design of the rest of it, which don't worry, we're tearing to shreds soon, if it's at all humanly possible, in real time, I think your odds here are lower than winning the lottery. Well, I suppose we're getting the jumper part anyway then that you normally need to clear the spiked walls from before. This is located in North Pole Area's alternate pathway, which is opened with the Nightmare Effect from Blaze Heatnix, an effect that's still active with our stage order. To enter that pathway, you need to do a little damage boost from an enemy to cross the spikes before the ladder, and once you're in, you make your way down to the bottom here. The injured Reploid is chilling on the other side of this large bed of spikes, which may seem out of the question initially, but fear not. By moving up via this rope and triggering more burning meteors to drop, when one falls in the right direction, you can quickly head back down, take damage from the meteor, and then abuse the resulting invincibility frames to dash jump across the spikes. When executed correctly, you can in fact reach the Reploid and receive his jumper part. After equipping that, back to Nightmare Mother we go, and thankfully, jumping over the blobs, regardless of direction, is now viable. That said, there is no telegraph that informs where they're gonna go, and by the time your brain registers their movements, you're too late already if they decide to move clockwise specifically. There is, however, more breathing room for counterclockwise, and this provides a slight bit of hope. By preparing a dash jump toward the wall on the left at the very instant the blobs are going to move, you build in a hair more leniency to jump over a clockwise spin around the room, as well as to shift back to the right if you see the top left blob moving down and you're moving counterclockwise. I must stress again though that this is crazy difficult, and I never got this part down super well. I regularly failed it. Practically, it's a 50-50 dice roll and you just 
just kinda gotta cross your fingers, you're aiming for the right direction. You would assume we're boned as Zero without the jump apart since X was, but Zero's double jump comes to the rescue again and can be used to squeeze yourself between the two blobs with correct positioning and mid-air control. Once more, this is by no means easy to pull off, but more realistic for sure, and I mostly mastered it by the end. Unfortunately, we've only scratched the surface of what makes Nightmare Mother such a dumpster fire. As the blobs are moving around, they can shoot out projectiles in completely random directions at complete random, so even if your reflexes and movement are flawless, sometimes you will suddenly get hit by one of the projectiles, or you try to course correct because they're in the way, but in doing so, you may lose precious time and spacing to avoid the blobs themselves. That's wonderful, isn't it? And fucking hell, I haven't even talked about her active attack phases that occur in between all this yet. There's a bunch of different formations the blobs can take on with different ambushes they unleash. What you get is always decided at random because that's a fetish of the designers apparently. And generally, the only setup you really want is where the two are stacked above each other. The rest of them are usually unfavorable for one of two reasons. Either there isn't as much opportunity to get in hits, and any single phase longer this boss goes on can make the difference between life or death, or avoiding damage is a crapshoot if not straight up impossible. The epitome of the latter issue are the godforsaken electricity bolts, where it's utterly random when and where they will shoot down toward the ground, with no visual cue at all to indicate they are winding up. Sometimes I would be struck by the lightning multiple times in one phase, other times I wouldn't get hit once. It's such asinine bullshit, and to make matters worse, this attack will typically drive you into a corner to stay as safe as possible, but there is no cooldown period once this stuff is over. The blobs will instantly transition into their rotation phase, so if you're on the wrong side, then suck it up, because that's another free hit you're taking. I kid you not, I could publish a book about why Nightmare Mother is such an insufferably terrible boss, especially under these conditions, but it boils down to this. There are so many situations where you never, ever stand a chance of avoiding damage. As a result, beating Nightmare Mother came down to a combination of stellar execution and phenomenal luck, and that combination is exactly what makes her so torturous and draining. Still, I was determined and had a W within reach on so many separate occasions as X, so I knew it was possible. And after five hours of slamming my head into the same brick wall over and over, I somehow clutched one out. Dear lord, I was on the edge of dying there, but I finally made Nightmare Mother mine, and while it took another three hours to do a zero, the eyeballs have invincibility periods after being hit, so zero saber skills are no more helpful in this case than X's, I did pull through, and this is a massive weight lifted off my shoulders, Christ. In conclusion, for Secret Lab 1, the Ice Burst weapon, and I'm fairly confident the jumper part, is the minimum required to complete the entire stage as X, whereas Zero can get by without any upgrades. On to Secret Lab 2, and before I enter, I unequip the jumper part as X to see how far we can make it here without. Just a heads up. The main area in Secret Lab 2 we should focus our attention on is here. If you're proficient at bullet hell games, then uh, you've got a leg up, because this part is all about overseeing every tiny thread on screen and dodging and attacking appropriately. Nightmare viruses, these rolling turret things along the floors and walls, the totem poles returning from Central Museum, and even the rocket platforms from Inami Temple. My advice? Use the rockets as a dynamic wall-jumping surface to wreck the totem poles, be extremely patient, and most importantly, get good. It is also very helpful to inch forward slowly, step by step, to put enemies within reach of buster shots while simultaneously not triggering them to come after you. Invaluable for taking out the nightmare viruses. And whatever you do, once you've reached this devilishly crammed spike bit at the end, do not rush your decision to go for it. Wait for the rocket pattern to line up in an ideal fashion as to minimize the risk of dying. The next checkpoint is only at high max, and you do not want to redo all of that bullet hell. Seemingly, as per tradition now, the entire section is miles easier with Zero since his double jump allows him to cling onto rockets up above him, skipping over like half the enemies, and his saber skills can be put to great use on the totem poles. Plus, his air dash makes the spike bit less nerve-wracking, so that's another benefit. Behind Central Museum, I found this to be the toughest piece of level design to overcome, but on the bright side, with the knowledge and the sauce, Hymax is duck suit by comparison. All you have to do is the following. Attack his shields when you can, dash away from under the shields when they are about to drop down, and jump 
jump over Hymax as he zooms across the room. As X, that last step is admittedly not the most forgiving to perform over and over, but it's within reason, and as Zero, you can simply use the air dash, which is very reliable. How long Hymax sticks around in this phase, I'm not too certain, it seems random, but just keep it up until the next phase. Unfortunately, X cannot damage Hymax at all with his buster, so we're gonna have to use a weapon to do so. I'm gonna use the Magma Blade for reasons that will become clear later, but since there is a delay on swinging it, you want to be very careful not to hit this ball. Doing so will unleash this craziness, and you're basically screwed. Regardless, it is possible to beat Hymax this way. On the flip side, Zero is an absolute mad lad and can hit Hymax with his saber. No techniques needed, so once it's Desbu time, get into a rhythm, focus, and put that punk to bed. As far as I'm concerned, this is the easiest out of all the Fortress bosses. No contest. Hold off on celebrating though, because in one of X6's cruel twists, Secret Lab 2 is not over yet. That's just wonderful, and it's peculiar that X and Zero get their own dedicated sections here. Nothing about Zero's is different than usual, since it's another Crusher segment where the only active danger are instant kills. Moving over to X's section then, just jump over and pass through the Monbandos in your path, there's a health restore pad up ahead, and soon enough, there it is. A long stretch of abyss that infamously cannot be crossed without either the blade armor or specific parts. Well, that is at least not in a manner that's intuitive or seemingly even intended by the developers. After getting X to slide down to the very bottom of this platform and then dash jumping off, open the pause menu, equip the magma blade, and keep spamming that weapon to slow down your descent. With proper execution, you can make it over to the other side. Who knew, right? And this is also the reason we were using the magma blade on high max. The rest of X's section is pretty straightforward and relaxing even by this point. This just leaves us with r to take care of. This is a horrible boss fight if you attempt to play its game honorably with the awkward and unproductive clutter of platforms and balls that can easily explode right onto you in trying to hit gates. You know, fuck that, cheese him with this tactic instead. Hop back and forth between the left and right platforms at the bottom whenever Gate flies toward you, let him shoot a ball, and then slide down the wall next to you. Ideally, strike the ball two times with the Z Saber and land your third hit when you're low enough to be out of range of the splash zone. This is a little precise, so if you mess up, you can always jump back up and take a hit if necessary. Remember, the goal is to comparatively lose less health than Gate. Sometimes you may have to improvise another angle of approach regardless if you get a ball in an undesired spot, but carry out the strategy above whenever you can, and you may be pleasantly surprised. As X, anyway. For whatever reason, the number of hits the game registers on these balls when Zero slashes them is wildly inconsistent. In fact, occasionally they can be denied altogether. I don't doubt there is some kind of logic behind this, it would be a criminal offense if they purposefully programmed in randomness, but whatever the variables are, they're so nebulous and unclear that for all intents and purposes, it is random. End result, since I don't think there is a way to predict how many slashes a ball will take, they can explode from a single swing, and other times they may take more hits than anticipated, allowing their various effects to take hold and gate to catch up to you. It's so bizarre and pissed me off badly. They should have called this Mega Man Party X6, that would have been a more informative and accurate title. Whatever, with Aron Gate defeated, that's a wrap for Secret Lab 2. X needs the assistance of the Magma Blade weapon, whereas Zero is still in the race for the challenge as a whole. Let me tell ya, never had I been happier to hear this. <laughs> It feels like I truly earned it. Man, I can't believe it. We've made it to the home stretch, the last stage. The franchise tradition of a boss rush takes place here, and honestly, I think we can safely skip over it, considering it's the eight Mavericks again. If you could beat them before, you can beat the majority of them a second time with little issue, even though they have more health now. As you'd expect, the one exception is Infinity Maginion. This guy just blows, and the health buff only makes him worse. Nevertheless, the approaches are no different, so to make a long story short, do what you did before, except do it better, or get luckier, either of the two works. Right before Sigma, there is a bit of regular stage with a boatload of nightmare viruses and other enemies that I frankly think are not even worth trying 
trying to eliminate all cleanly and neatly, it seems like a grueling task, one you can forgo by damage boosting through the tanky boys early on, and then killing, dashing, and jumping around foes carefully in order to reach the boss door before kicking the bucket. I'm too lazy to describe how I did it, watch the footage which is principally identical for Zero as well. Alright, this is it, the final showdown, and the last obstacle in our way to finishing the challenge. Because X6 is such a polished and balanced video game, Sigma himself is actually a hell of a lot less difficult than Nightmare Mother or even Gate, and possibly the least difficult final boss in the X series. Despite that, it's still garbage because it's another boss where getting solid luck is half the battle. In the first phase, Sigma may straight up never attack you and hand you a free win, or he may attack you and combine multiple stuns that, together, turn avoiding damage into a pipe dream. The attacks individually are rather inconsequential, however, so how much health you'll lose here before the second phase is partially up in the air. Your experience with the second phase will also be heavily dictated by how generous the game is feeling. Sigma himself barely attacks you. He just summons a bunch of slime monsters that can shoot projectiles and is not vulnerable in these moments. He only becomes vulnerable when he opens his mouth to cast his laser spell or Hippendro or whatever the hell he shouts. Hippendro. Not to sound like a broken record, but when he decides to open his mouth is random. It could be near instantly and quickly in a row, or it could take minutes to happen once. In light of that, there's not much I've got in the way of tips because both phases are quite simple in nature, so do your best to dodge what you can, and sooner or later you'll beat Sigma. He's practically in the bag if your ass can make it this far and fully doable without any upgrades needed for either character. And this means I can officially confirm that yes, it is possible to beat Mega Man X6 on Extreme with no upgrades as Zero. It's a shame Secret Lab 1 and 2 are not possible as X, we were so close to a complete home run, but alas, it is what it is and we still push the game to its bare minimum limits of what is necessary. I'll take both playthroughs as an achievement for myself at least, and I think it's forever cemented my belief that X6 is poorly made regardless of how good I've become at it. Doing challenge runs without any crutches and bandages to rely on tends to reveal the true quality of a game's core design underneath it all, and it's a disaster in X6. The difficulty balancing is unspeakably sporadic, and the hardest bosses are only as hard as they are because you cannot avoid their attacks when the internal slot machine doesn't cooperate. A few stages were fun and more fair, notably Inami Temple and the bullet hell in Secret Lab 2, but holistically, the journey felt more time-consuming and like I was being cheated a lot, rather than rewarding. Self-explanatory, the game wasn't intended to be played like this, but for the most part, I loved doing these same challenges for the previous X installments. If you ask me, I think that sums up everything. Thanks for stopping by, fellas. I hope you enjoyed this trip down X6 memory lane in some sense, and watching me suffer, I guess. If you would like to support the channel, consider backing me on Patreon. I have a single, universal tier of $1 per video, not per month, and every little bit really helps me out to produce videos more regularly. That's all I've got for today, so thank you for making it to the end, and peace out.